Well, thanks. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Um, now I get to, to say uh, all the stuff that I didn't have time to say yesterday. Well, maybe not all the stuff, but I'll... Uh, and here again, I'm also happy to, to respond to questions. If you have a burning question in the middle, uh, jump up and wave your hands and, uh, until I see you. So um, if, if you were here yesterday, then you remember that we're, what we're really trying to do is to organize uh, the world's energy systems in a way to, to provide economic security, uh, environmental security, and, uh, and energy security. Now, obviously, all of those things are linked. Um, and, and, so, um, uh, and also, I showed this, uh, this uh, slide yesterday as well. This is a map of, uh, of all the energy we might be able to uh, uh, put to work uh, on uh, uh, for our use. Um, as I said yesterday, lots of sunlight coming in. If you look at that, that warms the surface. It made, did the photosynthesis that, uh, that laid down the carbon that is uh, in coal, uh, oil, and gas resources. There are nuclear resources. There's a big geothermal resource. Um, and, uh, and the conclusion from all of this is that there's no shortage of energy. There's, there's plenty to be adapted. What we have to do is to figure out how to convert that into energy services uh, economically, and so uh, I'll, the rest of the talk will be um, uh, about uh, ways to do that and thinking about, in some cases, speculating about ways uh, that we might do that in, in the future. Um, and I will say that, you know, at any given time when we have a conversation about uh, uh, what makes sense from uh, an energy standpoint, we often talk about the cost. Uh, we talk about the cost of solar, the cost of wind, the cost of uh, uh, natural gas generation. But we should remember that costs evolve over time, particularly as we get to scale uh, in uh, various systems. Um, and uh, it's, it's not universally true, but it's usually true that when we learn how to do things, uh, the, the costs uh, come down. Um, and so, you know, you can see uh, transistors gone down a lot in price. There's no scale down here. The, often these are plotted as a uh, versus doubling of uh, of uh, the uh, size of the system, uh, but nevertheless, uh, costs do evolve. And part of the work for the, those of us who are engineers and thinking about this is to figure out ways to bring those costs down so that we can deploy uh, other systems. So I want to say a little more about the grid. Um, uh, I talked about this yesterday. I mean, you, we, we need to be thinking about a grid that provides services that are, that are uh, different from what we have now. Um, it needs to adapt to the to renewables. It needs to, to be more resilient. Um, but there is some progress on this. And, um, and uh, I just uh, I had a chance when I was working at DOE to, uh, to go visit the Chattanooga. They did a project with uh, uh, Recovery Act funds in which they installed a, a whole lot of smart meters. Uh, they connected them all up with a gigabit um, uh, fiber optic uh, uh, system, which was clever in the sense that, one, it gave a fast way for all these meters to report into the system, but it also um, provided, they could provide fast uh, 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 internet access to their customers. That helped pay for some of the operating costs and pay for some of the installation costs, so the combined uh, had uh, real value. And once those smart meters are there, those are, those are all sensors. So as long as those meters are talking, that place has power. But when a storm came through, they showed me a lovely little video of a storm coming through um, uh, the Chattanooga area, and when a tree fell over on a, on a, on a power line, um, the meters right around that went away. They also had uh, some active switches, so some contr centrally controllable switches, so they, in many cases they could reroute power to those places, uh, but they also knew exactly where to go look for uh, the problem when they had it. So it reduced uh, operating costs uh, and, uh, uh, and has actually been a very successful deployment uh, with better services, faster restoration when there were problems. Um, the other area that I would say is, um, so, so that's, that's been demonstrated there, the, 
there are some other places around the country, but there's a lot of the world that we still have um, uh, the opportunity to, to do things like this um, that will improve services. The other thing I would say with regard to the grid is that, you know, we exist in a world with, uh, with complicated systems that the grid is one of them for electricity, uh, pipelines that deliver fuels like natural gas and diesel and oil, um, a, uh, a water, uh, transportation, all those systems are linked together uh, and they all depend on each other in, in all kinds of interesting ways. Now, electrons respond very quickly to changes. Uh, natural gas pipelines, the gas moves at, at no more than about 30 miles an hour, so it responds much more slowly to, to changes for demands. These systems are linked, they depend on each other. You can't generate electricity without the natural gas. You can't uh, move the natural gas without electricity. So we should be thinking about these systems of systems, systems of complex systems, um, in ways that are more sophisticated than we have done so far. So I think there's a real research opportunity here. And we also need to worry about market uh, evaluations and, uh, uh, and privacy and uh, cybersecurity. So there's plenty to do there. Um, I want to talk a little more about the carbon capture and storage area because um, this is, uh, is potentially important. It, it determines whether we have um, uh, resources uh, can use, the, the, for example, the coal resources, or later in this century, uh, it may determine how we use natural gas uh, uh, continuing. Now, I showed this slide yesterday. Uh, this is the Kemper plant. This one was uh, set up to burn coal, but now has been switched to natural gas because of the problems in, in uh, sorting out a, uh, a very complex gasification process. Um, uh, so that was a disappointing uh, project. There's one outside Houston called Petronova uh, that is, uh, has been much more successful. They do a uh, conventional, uh, uh, this is just a pulverized coal plant, a conventional uh, uh, amine separation is used. The part of it that's, that uh, is for capture is uh, 240 megawatts with uh, about 90% uh, capture. So one and a half million tons a year. It's the largest coal-fired capture project in the world uh, so far. And the CO2 is used for enhanced oil recovery. Now this project was installed when oil was uh, priced at about uh, something like $100 a barrel. It's now roughly $50 a barrel. So while it was making money nicely at the $100 a barrel, it's kind of barely breaking evening, uh, even at 50. And that's a challenge for doing this kind of project going forward in periods of oil, uh, low oil prices, uh, the, the um, uh, demand for CO2 for enhanced oil recovery is, is reduced. Um, so that's, a, that's an issue going forward. Um, in this case, this was a, this was a conventional uh, separation. There's some really good work uh, uh, going on here at, um, at Brigham Young, uh, uh, Larry Baxter and his team uh, working on uh, uh, the, the uh, using um, uh, uh, cryogenic separations. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to take you through all of that because you have a much better person to tell you about it here, but I just wanted to acknowledge the, the work that's going on, on here and the, the good things about it. There's another example of, and what I would say is, is interesting about uh, Larry and his team's work is that it puts things together that you know, we've had individually, but puts them together in interesting ways that, that capitalizes on improved efficiency. Here's another one that, uh, that uh, is just uh, now being tested. This is, this is a, a company formed to do this specific project called Net Power. And in a, in a conventional uh, natural gas combined cycle plant, you, you have the, the fire over here, um, you have a, a gas turbine, um, if it's an aero derivative, this all happens in the same place. The, with those hot gases, um, uh, turning a turbine and then a, a, a steam generator and a steam turbine downstream, that's combined cycle. Uh, this version is different. It uh, has an air separation re, uh, unit upstream. Um, it still burns, but now you're burning with pure oxygen. So you don't have to separate the combustion product gases from nitrogen, but you do have to pay the price of separating the oxygen from the nitrogen upstream. And the other th thing that's uh, a, a, a new here is a, a supercritical CO2 turbine. I'll say a mo word more about this than Ian. This, you end up then, um, so there's some challenges in burning 
um, the methane in a, in a, a recirculating CO2 stream. If you just burn it uh, straight, then you melt the turbine downstream and that's a disadvantage. So, so instead you, re you recycle some CO2, um, but now you have to keep this flame alive in, um, in a, uh, a stream of uh, fast flowing uh, uh, hot CO2 here. So there's some challenges, some design challenges there. Downstream, you, have, uh, you, you need to separate the water. The water comes from the combustion part of the process, but this process actually makes fresh water. Um, so in a dry place, this actually could be uh, uh, quite useful. Um, and, uh, and then the CO2 is already coming out of that turbine at pressure, so it can, uh, it can be sent off for uh, uh, CO2 capture and storage. Um, and so let me say a word about the turbine. So, any turbine is just a series of little wings arranged in a, a circle, and what drives the turbine is mass flow over the wing. It's the same kind of thing that uh, keeps your airplane aloft. Um, and uh, if you do this with uh, steam, it's, it's not terribly dense, and it takes a big turbine, you can see a schematic of a, a human here. Um, uh, this is a dual, five-stage dual turbine that uh, generates 300 megawatts electric. If you do the same thing with CO2 in the supercritical region where it's denser, and, the, and so you have more mass flow over the wing for a given volume of fluid, fluid, it doesn't need to be as big a turbine. And you can see this is a single stage turbine that also generates 300 megawatts. So there's a big difference in size. And it, you know, once the technology is, is proved out, it should be a difference in cost uh, and footprint as well. So, um, so there really is a, uh, an opportunity. Uh, as with always, there are some challenges with regard to seals and uh, operating conditions that still have to be uh, sorted out. So lots more to do on thinking about that. On the whole carbon capture side, the thing to remember there too is that there really are lots of options here. Um, we, for power plants and cement plants and biomass combustion or whatever, uh, those are concentrated sources and you can have a variety of ways you can do the separation. Um, for you can think about taking CO2 out of the air. This is, this is quite a lot harder in terms of uh, uh, because of the low concentration of the CO2 in the air, but plants do it all the time. Uh, and then there are a lot of things that you can do at the other end uh, with the CO2. So um, I could spend the whole rest of the talk today talking about the various options here, but you can kind of see the, the variety of things that there are to do that, to make these efficient and cost competitive. Um, now, I, I, I have to say I'm often asked about this, so I'm going to say something about the, the outlook for carbon capture and storage, and it is, um, it's a tough time. We have a long history of CO2 injection for enhanced oil recovery since the 1970s. When I was a, a fledgling engineer at Shell in the middle 1970s, I worked on some of the early uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery projects. Um, and we have a lot of experience and know a lot about what CO2 does in the subsurface. But enhanced oil recovery depends on the price of oil. So when the price of oil is where it is now, it's hard to uh, see how to make money unless we can reduce the cost of the separations a lot. Um, most of the CO2 that's been used so far has been separated anyway from natural gas because they had to do that in order to sell the, the natural gas. So uh, uh, demonstration testing, I think, is likely to continue. Um, but in the absence of a carbon price, for example, this is not likely to be deployed in a big way. Um, if there were a sufficient carbon price, then you'd think about all kinds of, there's lots of poor space uh, out there, so we could put it lots of places. Um, but really, cost reduction of the separations is a key component going forward, so it's definitely a worthy area of research. Um, in the wind area, uh, gosh, there's a, so wind is fundamentally a fluid mechanics problem. You have these big wings uh, on the, the turbine here, um, but we typically put them in, uh, in arrays, and so uh, if, you've, if, the, if the next turbine is right downstream of the first one, then the, the wakes uh, matter. Um, there are ways to manage the wakes. I said this yesterday, that uh, uh, by steering the turbines, there, there are lots of opportunities to think about optimization and where you place the turbines to begin with. Um, and, this, and this is a big resource. If you go back and look at that resource slide, you can see that there's a, there's a lot of wind that can put to, be put to work here. So the, we can still reduce costs here. There are lots of materials issues in the turbines and uh, 
uh, and plenty of things to do here. Um, and, uh, and, and part of this depends on high fidelity, high performance modeling. Uh, part of it depends on thinking about these systems of, um, of uh, uh, turbines operating together. And part of it thinks about being, uh, doing a good job of weather prediction so you know uh, something about when, uh, when those turbines all, are all going to want to face the other way so that they don't fall over in the, in the windstorm. What about, um, what about uh, solar? Um, solar is a, actually a good example of w how the research community really can uh, contribute to uh, something like this. This is a plot of time at the bottom axis and the efficiency of the solar cell. And you can see back in the 70s, uh, they were lower. Uh, they've continued in, on up the, the, in the multi-junction uh, uh, cells. They're up in the mid 40s, but these are pretty expensive. Um, and the, the uh, organic uh, uh, and quantum dot cells, you know, they're marching up the curve. I just point out this, this one here. These are perovskites. Um, I, I won't talk much about the, the d detail here, but in a very short period, these things are cheap. They're made of abundant materials. Um, they, we need some work because they're, they're not terribly stable unless you have good coatings on them. But uh, still, they've marched up this curve much more steeply than uh, uh, almost anything else. So if you're a material scientist interested in uh, photovoltaics, um, this is still an area where there really is a big opportunity. We think of solar being cheap, uh, and, and it is now, but at the same time, there's an opportunity to do much better. And you'll see in my wish list later that, uh, that uh, I'd really like to have very inexpensive uh, solar electrons as a way to give us an opportunity to do all kinds of other things with that electricity. And I just will say, too, that uh, there really is there are lots of jobs in, uh, in solar now, uh, and so that's a, uh, that's a benefit as, uh, as well. So um, what about other renewables? They can certainly contribute in the right place. Um, the, uh, the geothermal uh, uh, area is one where um, we can, in principle, adapt the kinds of things that have made it possible to do uh, uh, use a lot of natural gas uh, that we couldn't do before. Uh, there's the potential at least to reduce the, the cost of, um, of capturing uh, thermal energy out of hot rocks. Um, if, if those are dominated by the cost of drilling and whether or not you can create an appropriate flow path between the wells. In the earliest days, they, uh, they drilled separate wells into the so-called hot dry rock and tried to fracture them so that they would connect. But unfortunately, the fractures didn't always go exactly where you wanted them to go. So then they got smarter. They said, well, let's drill the first well, fracture it, listen carefully to where the, the fractures are, and we'll drill in to intersect those. So that worked. Um, but, uh, but it still uh, looked uh, uh, like additional advances are needed to reduce the costs enough. Hydro and pumped hydro have a, an appropriate role when there's a, both a terrain relief and uh, enough water. Um, and marine and hydrokinetic can, uh, can uh, uh, contribute in specific places, um, but the size of the resource is one to, to make this be more limited in its total, uh, total application. Uh, but in the right place, it really can make a difference. Now, one thing I would just offer as a word of caution here. Uh, the term we use in, the, in thinking about what fraction of the time a plant operates is called the capacity factor. Um, and sometimes that's imposed by natural limitations. The sun shines about half the, uh, half the time and it's not directly perpendicular to that solar, solar cell unless it's tracking. Uh, so uh, solar has the one capacity factor. Wind is typically a bit higher, but you can see the kinds of ranges from um, uh, oceans and waves and uh, on the various uh, things. Geothermal has the advantage. Uh, you can tell this, this slide was made by one of my geothermal colleagues because he's, uh, he's pointing out that, uh, that geothermal can do reliable baseload kinds of things. But when you think about the capacity of a, of a generation system, um, it uh, sounds like my mic uh, might be, I don't know if it needs a battery, but um, it, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily 
uh, generate all that power all the time. So that's something to think about. Capacity weighted generation is something we should also think about. So, okay, let's, uh, let's abandon that topic and move to transportation. Uh, again, there's a, we have now a combustion dominated um, uh, system. There are plenty of improvements of understanding the fluid mechanics and mixing and reaction at the, uh, um, uh, at the cylinder level in a, uh, in a vehicle. Uh, there are potential for fuel cells, there's uh, plug-in electrics, so those, those are typically battery uh, dominated. Um, and then we really think need to think more about air, rail, and marine systems uh, because uh, it's, it's, it's easier to think about urban transportation with battery electric vehicles. Uh, now maybe I'm insufficiently imaginative, but I'm, I'm having a hard time uh, uh, imagining flying uh, 747 with batteries, uh, at the moment at least. The, the batteries are going to have to get to be a lot better, so there's some challenges there. Um, the electrical, electric vehicle area is one that would, uh, is really beginning to take off. It's, it, these vehicles, over the next few years, they are going to be sort of one-to-one um, -one competitive in price with, uh, with conventional vehicles. Um, and at least with electricity as it's on its average price across the nation, they're quite a bit cheaper to operate. And, you, and they have a lot less maintenance than a conventional uh, vehicle. And they're pretty zippy if you've, uh, if you've driven one. They have lots of good uh, low-end torque and accelerate uh, rapidly. Um, but of course, these are, um, uh, these, that's a relatively small fraction of sales, about 1% one, about 1 worldwide. But lots of auto manufacturers have announced new vehicles to be on the market by the mid-20s. Um, and, uh, and several countries uh, uh, are talking about uh, prohibiting uh, internal combustion engines at some point. Uh, it wouldn't be totally surprising if those uh, slipped uh, in the timing. Uh, uh, China's planning a deadline but hasn't announced what it's going to be. So there are, there are significant transformations underway. Um, in the electric vehicle market, uh, but, but we'll have to, to, to spend a little more time to see uh, how these trends uh, really, um, really go. Uh, U.S. and uh, China are the biggest markets uh, uh, so far, but uh, if you weighted this by population, I think Norway wins because they have a big, uh, uh, big subsidy for uh, electric vehicles. So uh, lots more to be seen um, and, uh, and kind of fun to watch. Um, and, and I just say that, that you know, this, this is the stuff that's being deployed now. Let me also just talk a little bit. This is, these are some slides from a project that uh, I led in the early days at uh, Stanford called the Global Climate and Energy Project. And we just challenged our researchers there to, to try to think out of the box, to look for some, some things that might be hard to do now, but, but uh, were, uh, had the potential to be game changing if we, uh, if we did it. So they ranged from very, um, uh, very efficient diesel engines with low, uh, low uh, soot, from batteries based of, on silicon nanowires nano that can charge and discharge without uh, falling apart due to the volume change, uh, from uh, wireless uh, transfer of energy to uh, a moving vehicle from a, um, uh, antennas in the roadway uh, to um, uh, polymers that might help uh, uh, batteries uh, survive without uh, growing dendrites that connect and so on and so on. Uh, so they're just, the, the range of options for doing this better is just really uh, hard to, to uh, show. Uh, in terms of renewable fuels, um, uh, some work at Caltech on uh, uh, on water splitting, um, uh, some more uh, water, water is, you know, it's actually tough to split and the things that split it best corrode in the water. So, so you have to figure out how to, to uh, deal with that. Um, the uh, uh, working on, on using catalysts to reduce, uh, take energy and reduce uh, uh, CO2 uh, to something that could be made into a fuel um, and so on and so on. Uh, lots of uh, uh, opportunities there. On the biomass side, uh, there's plenty of, of biomass out there that we could use even without compromising fuel supplies. Um, but, uh, and climate change will have some impact on all of this, so we need to take that into account. 
Uh, we can look at how productivity might change uh, with climate. Um, we can think about enzyme systems to make hydrogen. Uh, and we can look at, um, um, at how to, to reduce the fraction of lignans that are present. So, so um, uh, biomass has, uh, has uh, sugars and carbohydrates, lignans, and, uh, uh, and hemicellulose. The lignans are the stiff stuff that makes your plant be able to um, stand up and intercept the sunlight. But it also makes it hard to get the other stuff out that you want to convert into, uh, into a fuel. If you take the, you, so you can knock out the gene that, uh, that, that uh, uh, leads to most of the lignin formation, but when you do, you get a very unhappy plant. Um, it, uh, it doesn't stand upright and it can't, uh, uh, can't support the, uh, the, the capillary forces that draw water up in the plant. So you have to do something different. So, so there's been a group uh, that's really been looking at ways to, to uh, make those either be more easily attacked in, in refining or grow plants that have less lignin but still grow okay. Um, and there's been lots of good stuff. And, and then finally, I'll say a word about connected and automated vehicles. Um, you can, if you'd like to start an argument at a party, here's how you do it. So you say connected and automated vehicles will reduce energy use for transportation. Or alternately, you say it will increase transportation costs by a lot. Well, I can tell you that if you go comb through the literature, you can find every one of those results depending on what you, uh, assumptions you make about how all we humans behave as we think about using those transportation services. The vehicles themselves can be made much more efficient. They'll drive in their sweet spot, sweet spot they'll do less running into each other, and they'll uh, take into account traffic. Um, on the other hand, um, the, uh, if, if we all use a lot more services in California, it's expensive to live in San Francisco, so if the transportation is really good, maybe you live in Fresno and uh, have the, the automated vehicle take you there. That's an exaggeration, but, but you can see how that, uh, that part of it. So there's plenty to be thought about on the social side there. And then finally, I would say, that if you're really looking for exciting and interesting things to think about, if you, if you think about CO2 and things that, uh, and, and what we use at the scale that we make CO2, there are really only a couple of things. One is fuels. So, so wouldn't it be nice to be able to take that CO2 that we made and then, and then take, for example, cheap solar energy um, and turn it back into uh, a fuel that we could use again. Now that takes more energy than you're going to get by burning it, so it has to be really cheap CO2. Plus you have to have a way to do this. Um, in a world where we're electrifying the planet, then maybe, um, maybe we should think about electrochemistry to do some of the, at least some of the reactions, um, and there are lots of ways you can think about doing that. Um, now, I don't discount how hard this problem is. Uh, catalytically, it's difficult. Um, and, uh, and the high reaction pathways often look too complex uh, uh, to, uh, to be cost effective now. But by golly, this is an area, this combined area of electrochemistry and catalysis uh, and, um, uh, and nanostructured materials of all kinds, those, there's just a huge range of interesting things to be done there that uh, I think all of us uh, uh, can get excited about that. I'd also say that we shouldn't neglect the way we make things. Um, so uh, much of this office, uh, audience is too young to remember the Shelby Cobra of the 1960s. This was a muscle car with a 428 cubic inch engine and, and it was a rocket. Um, uh, but it was not exactly fuel efficient and it probably didn't meet any safety standard ever. Um, but, uh, but golly, it was fun. Well, here's, here's a, a version of it that was made uh, quite recently on a 3D printer. Um, and the interesting thing about this, I mean, this was, uh, it, it's, it's electric, so it doesn't have a, uh, uh, a big piston engine in it anymore. But the, the printed Cobra project from design to prototype took six people in six weeks. Uh, and then it was 3D printed and then they put a nice paint job on it. Um, and uh, so, 
So these kinds of advanced uh, uh, technologies for 3D printing can reduce cost, reduce time, um, and uh, make more efficient the process. And to, to try to illustrate the efficiency point, um, let me um, use this example. So um, some of you know that I'm a pilot, so I, I fly an airplane. This, uh, this, this bracket goes in a commercial airplane. It weighs about a kilogram. You, in order to make it, you have to, to, to start with um, you know, eight kilograms of stuff that you uh, process and machine uh, and then finally end up with that kilogram. So the, the buy to fly ratio is about eight to one in terms of material that ends up in that. Um, if you do this with um, a, a advanced manufacturing, you spray a powder and then use electro beam uh, plating here, you start with half a kilogram of material and you end up with something that's just as strong and weighs four tenths of a kilogram because you can make this interesting shape. It's not, it's not limited by how you machine it. Um, and so uh, your, your buy to fly ratio is one and a half to one. And, uh, and the conventional bracket uses three times as much energy to fly it around because weight matters in that airplane. Um, and uh, uh, than the, uh, than the additive manufacturing uh, bracket uses. So it's a combination of materials efficiency uh, and, um, and energy efficiency in use that uh, there are lots of opportunities that uh, can be uh, taken advantage of there. And then, and then there are the ideas that don't really fit in any of the categories that, uh, that I've talked about. So I'll just illustrate a few, uh, again, done by my colleagues at, uh, at Stanford. Um, there's photo-enhanced thermionic emission. It turns out that by combining the way you use light, you can also uh, generate, uh, 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 from high temperature systems, you can generate energy. Um, you can use very cheap materials. Prussian blue is in every blue car um, out there. It costs hardly anything uh, to make um, uh, a long life cycle uh, battery electric, uh, electrolyte. Uh, you can think about ultra-fast batteries using aluminum, again, and graphite, uh, inexpensive materials. Um, and my favorite idea of all of these, the, the, this is a team that, that, they're photonics folks, so they manage light. And what they did was to say, well, look, there is uh, a portion of the spectrum where the atmosphere is just completely transparent to, um, to outgoing radiation. And if you can manage the wavelength of the, to, that you're radiating, and what you can do is by choosing the materials properly, then you're using radiative uh, forcing from that goes as the 10 to the fourth power against a three degree Kelvin uh, uh, sky out in space. Um, and you can basically do uh, cooling that takes advantage of the energy in the atmosphere with no moving parts, uh, now unless you connect a, a pump up to circulate fluid. Um, but they've done this on the roof of one of the Stanford buildings, and here's a, a little uh, picture of the uh, selective emitter here. Uh, and they really can get even, uh, you can, they can cool down to very low temperatures. Now, there are plenty of device things that have to be sorted out from this uh, proof of concept, but it's, a, it's kind of a whole new approach to thinking about cooling that doesn't demand vapor compression and, uh, or uh, electricity. And then I'll say one more thing uh, that, um, that matters here, maybe two more things. So one of the things you can do with add, add, additive manufacturing is to make that turbine blade. Now those of us who ride around in, uh, in airplanes powered by jet engines, um, we would like those turbine blades to hold together. Um, that's, they work better if they're all in one piece. Um, and, and that's at least uh, partly related to whether there are residual stresses in the system. If you take that turbine blade and put it as this one was in the, the spallation neutron source, um, you can image the residual stresses. And so we're using advanced scientific equipment. You can test these materials in a way that, uh, that we, we couldn't even a few years ago. Um, and, and so that, that, that ability to see what materials do and how they behave at a fundamental physical level is a way to, to uh, advance more quickly into the, into the energy future. Uh, there are lots of, uh, this was a DOE slide, so there are lots of uh, user facilities there, 
But I would just say we need to maintain these and support them. They help us lead the world um, in, the, in the best uh, material science. And I would say the same thing about uh, high performance computing. Um, we can do things nowadays with, uh, with uh, computational methods that, uh, that we couldn't even begin to think about because they, were, they required too much computing power even uh, only a few years ago. Uh, DOE is working now on the next generation of so-called exascale computing, 100 to 1,000 times faster than what we have now, and that will open up a whole new set of opportunities for all of us that range from uh, modeling uh, uh, the details, the full details of combustion in a turbine uh, to how to reduce wind drag on, a, um, uh, on a, a truck on the highway. And I will just, you've probably noticed those skirts that, that now are on the sides of uh, trucks. Those came out of a, a design that came out of a, a, a high performance modeling exercise and it penetrated the market pretty much instantly because it cost almost nothing, but it gave you an immediate return uh, in fuel, reducing fuel consumption. So it just goes to show you that, that advanced you know, computing may sound pretty esoteric, but it's fundamental to what we do in every other scientific uh, uh, and engineering area. So let me end here with uh, uh, a uh, uh, Lynn's current wish list. Now, if you ask me tomorrow, it might be different, but. Uh, but here are, the, here are some things that I think are within the realm of possibility that, uh, that I would love to see. I talked about electrochemical reduction uh, of CO2. The goal here is a drop-in liquid fuel that would use all the infrastructure we have. Biofuels that store carbon uh, and are uh, cost and store carbon in the, in the soil, for example, that helps us take uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, more efficient water purification. In a lot of the world, uh, water is an issue. Uh, there's no shortage of water, but a whole lot of it has salt in it, and so we need better ways to do that. Um, higher density, durable, safe batteries, uh, better sensitive sensors for fugitive methane emissions. Fugitive methane is a big, strong greenhouse gas, so if we're gonna use it in a big way, we also need to, to burn it and not, not let it get to the atmosphere. Um, uh, high frequency, high voltage power electronics. These would be smaller, cheaper transformers. We're pretty vulnerable in this country to the big transformers take a long time to get and they're manufactured overseas. So we, uh, we should do a, uh, uh, we should work on the, the power electronics side. There are, there are promising avenues there. Active controls on which way the power goes. You know, right now we manage the grid by turning power plants on and off and the wires are all connected up and it goes where it goes. Uh, we can, we can uh, uh, do that better. Um, air conditioning. You know, a big fraction of the world, uh, first of all, it's gonna get warmer and we're gonna need uh, more air conditioning. Um, and as a kid who grew up in Houston, uh, outside Houston and didn't have air conditioning when I was a little kid, my mom and dad got uh, a window air conditioner and they put it in their bedroom which we kids thought was really most unfair. Um, but of course the world has moved on and now I, I don't think anybody would live in, think about living in Houston without air, air conditioning. So, uh, and there's a big swath of the world that, uh, that is in that uh, same situation that I was in as a kid. Um, so we should work on this and there are some exciting out of the box opportunities there uh, for solid state cooling. Solar PV at two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, you know, I said this repeatedly, but if we have really cheap solar electricity, at least in some parts of the day, then that enables a series, uh, we can afford thermodynamically and, um, and uh, uh, in terms of cost, uh, another transformation that we could take to fuels or other energy services. So uh, something to be that said there. And then also while we're up, could we have a, a price on carbon? That would, uh, that would help us do this all as well. So, same conclusions as yesterday, really. Uh, we need to work across the portfolio, uh, and there's a huge opportunity to, to do all kinds of exciting things. And, uh, and so for students in the, this part of the world or any part of the world, uh, there's just a rich place to, uh, to work going forward. Thank you very much. I see a question back in the back. Yes, um, before I ask the question, on a yearly basis or just completely what we have? 
Uh, yeah, well, it's actually, it was a little bit of, of both of those. Let me uh, scoot back to that slide. There it is. Yeah, so the, the, the ovals here, these are the total amount of stored en energy, and we use about half a zeta joule per year. So yeah, it's, it's a, you know, there's, a, there's a huge nuclear resource. A bunch of it is uranium dissolved in the ocean. So, you, you, so capturing that resource requires separating a widely dispersed um, uh, set of atoms. So that part of it makes it harder, hard to use that. But there is a big resource there. Um, the other big, huge resource is the heat that's stored in the, in the, Earth's, uh, the upper part of the Earth's crust. So it's also uh, enormous. The, the, um, the, um, the arrows here uh, uh, indicate flows of energy. And, uh, and so, for example, we use, um, in, a, in a typical year, we use uh, um, this, this, these amounts are in ter terawatts, so this is a power flow. We use about four terawatts of coal or about uh, uh, five of oil. Um, so the arrows tell you something about how fast we use that. That's an average all the time of, of, uh, of the uh, flow in watts. Um, so you can kind of get the, uh, the scale of one, uh, one to the other. But I think the overall message is that there's, there's, there's really no shortage of energy. It's, it's how we convert it. Hi. Um, several years ago, I lost okay. competitive at all. Yeah. So it's a, it's a multiple choice question. There were three options for uh, nuclear waste. Um, one was, um, uh, uh, what was the first one? So I just, uh, is it just technologically yeah. too Te hard? Yeah, technologically to too hard. Well, no, uh, we could um, use it as a kind of a geothermal resource. Um, a, we, we actually know how to separate the, the things, that, the, the nasty things that are in those things. It is hugely expensive. So um, it's probable that we won't, um, we won't adopt that just as an energy resource now. There are many other cheaper things uh, to do. There was also part of this was the, the social acceptance of this. I, um, right now we have um, spent fuel stored at about uh, 100 plus uh, 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 nuclear reactors around the country. Plus we have repositories in, the, in waste at places like Hanford, Hanford and Savannah River. Um, it's hard to imagine any of those wanting to, to ad adapt those resources right there. So I think we have to make more progress on the, on the waste storage and disposal side um, before that will happen. And cost is really the, the, a primary barrier. And, and uh, uh, I, think, I think that would limit this more than anything else. So in the front. Well, yeah, so that's a good question. So the question is, if we intercept a whole lot of that, um, uh, that energy, do we uh, kill all the wind on the planet? Uh, um, and the answer, I think, is, is in the scale. Um, we humans use about, call it 15 terawatts. It's actually a little more than that now. Um, uh, and the, the surface gets 86,000 uh, terawatts. So, the flow of that energy, and a lot of it gets intercepted in the atmosphere, both the, the wind and evaporation, before it ever gets to us. So um, we would have to, to have just truly massive uses of, of energy before we ever get to anything that you could notice on, the, on that scale. So, so um, that one's not on my list of things to worry about. Uh, there, there are other bigger effects of this whole question here. <laughs> nuclear fusion. So the question is, what's DOE doing on nuclear fusion? Um, well, right now, I, I can tell you they're worrying about it. Um, the, they're, they're kind of two ends of this story, which I, I chose not to try to tell, but uh, now I'll do it. Um, so uh, there is a big uh, tokamak under construction in France. It's an international project. It was set up, uh, it's called ITER. Um, uh, it was set up uh, largely as a political agreement, uh, agreement amongst the six produ uh, participating countries uh, with a technical group working on it, but a design that was not very well fleshed out, um, and a group of political types managing the overhaul, and they, 
as the designs progressed, it was clear that it was going to cost more, but the, the political group at the top didn't want to talk about that to their countries. So it got behind schedule and over budget in a big way. Uh, the United States went in and said, uh, kind of, look it. Either we sort this out technically or we're out. Um, and uh, so they did, they made uh, management changes, got a new director, uh, reorganized the whole project, and then did that, uh, sat down and did careful cost estimates. Uh, meanwhile, they're well under construction. Um, and the costs are much higher and it will take longer than was originally planned. So some of the governments have said, uh, well, that's okay, we're gonna stick with it. Uh, other governments have said, yeah, this is really expensive. I don't know if we wanna do that. They're in the midst of discussing all that, and the United States uh, um, has to, uh, by sometime this fall, they have to report out to the Congress on, on what are the prospects for continuing. So that's the big central version. There are also a bunch of tri private uh, uh, small groups, uh, uh, Tri-Alpha is one that you might have heard of, um, that are looking at, um, at other modes of, uh, that are smaller, that use different physics, Pretty much all of them are a good long way from getting uh, what to, to uh, a sustained fusion reaction. There's also the National Ignition Facility that uh, uses a, a bunch of lasers to do inertial fusion to, to zap a little pellet of, of gold that contains uh, uh, deuterium and tritium and then and the, the, the compression that uh, happens then uh, 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 ignites the fusion. Um, Bottom line, uh, some interesting ideas, but we're a long way from, uh, from being able to do that at commercial scale. And I think cost is really gonna be a big issue as well. But, but important science to be done as we figure out uh, whether we can do that at, at scale. There's plenty of fuel, it's, uh, it's the cost. Yeah, so the question is, I didn't say anything about hybrids. Are they on the way out? And, uh, and I think the answer is no. I would. Yeah, I didn't split them out specifically, but actually a bunch of those numbers that I showed for, for sales include the hybrids. Um, there are various versions of hybrids, but they have a hugely valuable uh, uh, role to play because they take away the range anxiety for those that, um, that might, uh, you carry along some gasoline in case your, your, um, your battery gets all the way to the end. Um, and I think they have a very important transitional role. I mean, maybe, maybe we don't need them at some point, but for now, um, and I can tell you that in my family, my wife um, uh, drives a, a Chevy Volt, um, and which she hardly ever uses the gasoline, but when she needs it, she wants it. Um, and I drive a full EV, and so, um, uh, but then I get to walk to work, so I, you know, that's, uh, that works for me. So, so yes, I think the hybrids have a really important role to play. And they've also taught the vehicle makers a lot about, uh, about the electric drives and how to manage those, too. So. I see one more over here. It's a question on a longer chain lines, Yeah, yeah, so the, so, I mean, I think it's actually a broader question of, of the upstream impacts of the mining that goes with that. One very important part of all of this uh, for batteries is thinking about the end stage of them as well, so that those materials get recycled, so that uh, you'll, we'll still need some mining. That, it, it's not required that they use child, child labor. It's, uh, uh, so we should set some standards and, uh, and enforce them, uh, both in the environmental side of the, of the mining and the processing, uh, but also in, uh, in thinking about designs that can be, where the loop can be closed for those materials as well. Lots of opportunities for smart engineers to work on ways to do that too. Okay, well it looks like we're out of time, but let's thank Dr. Orr one more time.